Hello my fellow content seekers, I'm the Culture Crusader and on the weekend I finally went to cinemas again because I finally found a film that excited me enough to go. Yep, last week saw the release of one of my most anticipated films of the year, Barbie. Just kidding, I'm straight, I went to see Oppenheimer, obviously. And despite the cinema literally sending me an email begging me to book tickets to Barbie as well to complete the Barbenheimer combo, I was granted enough wisdom to resist. It is funny to me that despite this movie somehow managing to be even more obsessed with communism than the average Marvel writer, it was still a hell of a lot more appealing to me than a movie about a bunch of plastic pansies all in pink. Seriously, I don't think I've heard the word communism so many times in such rapid succession since the last time I accidentally opened Reddit for 5 seconds. Yet somehow, despite spending so much time talking about it, this film actually pushed the idea of communism far less than the likes of The Witcher Season 3 or Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness or many of the other modern movies and TV shows that we've all grown so tired of. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I can't believe I finally did it. I went back to cinemas. I finally found a movie that I cared enough to justify leaving the house to see. If anyone could bring me back to cinema, it was obviously going to be Christopher Nolan. I don't need to waste my time singing the praises of his past films. We all know how good a filmmaker he is, and this film is no exception. He just knows how to expertly capture the audience's attention and imagination, even in cases like this where the film is based on real people and real events, and someone like me would not normally even be remotely interested in it, but because it's Nolan I am. like. Before this movie was announced, if you had told me that the one film to draw me back to the cinemas after all this time would be a three hour movie about a nuclear physicist and a man trying to make it through a senate confirmation hearing, I would have been highly skeptical. Especially if you told me that it had basically no action scenes to speak of and would mostly just be people talking to other people in labs and government buildings. Yet all it would take is for you to tell me that it's a Nolan film and suddenly I would believe you. I don't know if any other filmmaker has that effect for me. And even though this is far from the kind of movie that I would usually enjoy, and equally far from what I've come to expect from Nolan, it still did not disappoint even a little. I knew it would be good. With everyone that was involved in the movie and all the creative choices I'd heard about leading up to it, I knew it would be as close to an objectively great movie as I've seen in a while. But I didn't expect to like it so much. I expected my comments to be things like, well, it's extremely well made, but it's just not the kind of movie I generally enjoy. But I did like it. I don't love it as much as something like Interstellar, another Nolan film which may or may not be my all time favourite movie or close to it. I could probably watch Interstellar once a month for a year straight and not get sick of it. This movie is not that. I probably do intend on watching Oppenheimer at least once more, but not anytime soon. It's a long movie and it requires a hell of a lot of concentration to even follow along, something I have grown used to expecting from Nolan films, but this is kind of next level. And it's not the kind of movie that leaves you like super excited or feeling good about the world. Quite the opposite actually. It really does not end on a high note at all. But it is genuinely a great movie and one day, maybe six months or a year from now, I could definitely see myself watching it again, especially if I was watching it with somebody who had not previously seen it. And it might not hurt to see it a second time just to fully understand everything that's happening in it because as I alluded to earlier, it requires a hell of a lot of focus to follow along, remember all the names, keep up with everything that's going on, especially with the non-linear storytelling. I genuinely got a headache after watching this movie, but I'm not sure how much of that was to do with brain power. I think it's just because our cinema was insanely hot for half the film and I didn't hydrate enough because I'm not dumb enough to drink a bunch of water at the beginning of a three hour movie, especially not a three hour movie that requires my full concentration where I cannot afford to miss a single moment. So extreme concentration plus minimal water plus sauna levels of heat in the cinema equals headache for the rest of the day, but it was still worth it. And now I'll try to give a brief non-spoiler section even though it does seem a little silly to say that when the movie is based on real events and real people's lives. Obviously there are certain things which are spoiled by default simply by existing in the current day and age. We all know that the atomic bomb was successfully developed by the USA and we all know it was used twice on Japan to end World War II. But I could pretty confidently say a large percentage of the audience do not know much, if anything, about J. Robert Oppenheimer and even fewer would be likely to know anything about Louis Strauss. Maybe in America all of this is taught in schools and everyone knows who these people are? I have no idea, but as an Australian I don't recall ever even learning about Oppenheimer and I'm certain I've never even heard the name Strauss before. So I guess that's my justification for why I feel like I still need to have a non-spoiler section in the movie review even when it's based on real history. So now onto the film itself. The acting is brilliant. This might be Robert Downey Jr's best performance that I've seen to date. 
Matt Damon is awesome in it. I barely even recognized Florence, I don't know how to say her last name, though that's not really saying much since I've only ever seen her in like one movie and one TV show before and they were both Marvel. And Killian Murphy obviously was absolutely incredible, though I still can't get over the fact that his name is pronounced Killian and not Cillian. I only learned that the day before scripting this review, and man am I lucky that I heard the correct pronunciation when I did, or else I would have spent this whole review calling him Cillian and making myself look even more retarded with each utterance of his name. Like literally I'm so worried about accidentally saying it wrong that I've started spelling it with a K when writing my script just to trick my brain into reading it correctly every time. Sorry Killian, it's either I butcher your name in the script and nobody sees it, or I butcher your name in the video and everybody hears it. I can't get it right on both fronts. The visuals were great, even though there's obviously no big action set pieces or anything like that. The alternating between black and white and full color was a really cool artistic choice. As were all the little visualizations of theoretical physics concepts that were, you know, interspersed throughout the film. The sound design for the most part was incredible, um, at least to the average viewer like me who knows nothing about that kind of thing. The score was perfect, but in typical Nolan fashion, there were numerous points in the film where it was almost impossible to hear or make out any of the dialogue over the music and sound effects and all that kind of stuff. You know, it wasn't all through the film, but there's definitely some parts. And in some parts, it was certainly done on purpose where you weren't really supposed to, it was supposed to be overwhelming. But there were definitely other parts where I felt like I might be missing crucial pieces of information because I just couldn't hear what the actors were saying. Maybe when I finally do rewatch it, I'll put on subtitles to make sure I didn't miss anything. But also, I guess in just in general, watching movies in cinemas, you're likely to miss the occasional line here and there. And, you know, it's one of the things that comes along with that. One thing that I liked about this film is that, as usual, Christopher Nolan does not treat the target audience like idiots. So many movies nowadays feel the need to over-explain everything because they don't trust the audience to make any connections on their own. It's one of the most irritating curses of modern Hollywood, but Oppenheimer does not fall into that trap. Even in scenes where they're discussing nuclear physics, Nolan does not feel the need to cater to the lowest possible IQ in the crowd and over-explain everything. It'd be very easy to write all the science scenes in a way that really does go out of its way to explain every relevant concept to the audience in a way that they understand. But then the problem would be the immersion, which would be shattered on the floor like the wine glasses Oppie was randomly throwing in the corner of his room at one point. It would completely break the immersion if we had all these hyper-intelligent nuclear physicists and other scientists taking the time to dumb down every concept when speaking to one another. It would be abundantly clear that the dialogue is written just for the audience and not for the characters, because these characters would already know about the concepts like fusion and fission and all that kind of stuff, and it would make no sense for them to be explaining basic science to one another like, you know, like a school child. It'd be like me talking to a fellow Star Wars fan and feeling the need to randomly derail the conversation to explain who Darth Vader is when the other person already clearly knows, just for the benefit of some invisible third party, you know, watching the whole interaction. And yet, as dumb as that would be, many of today's writers would have still done it, but not Christopher Nolan. Instead, this movie almost has a sense of, I don't care if you understand the science behind this, I'm going to write it realistically and you can either keep up or not, it's not my problem. And not in an arrogant way, just in a way that trusts the audience to follow the general gist of things even when they don't know the specifics. For example, the debate between whether to use fusion or fission to create the bomb. You don't really even need to know the difference between the two, though it would help. You just need to follow along enough to understand that there's two separate methods and one is a hell of a lot more destructive than the other. Once you know that, you can follow the arguments in the movie without even understanding the scientific underpinnings. And that's what Nolan relies on. People paying attention and using their brains to understand and keep track of everything that's going on even if they don't understand every minute detail. And that's why I would say this movie is not a film that you can just casually watch for a nice relaxing time. But it's also why it's so much better than most recent movies that I've seen, because there's almost something rewarding about a film that actually makes you think. This is the kind of film that almost makes the audience smarter by having watched it, rather than dumber. And I'll admit, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. But I did learn things from this movie, which is a very different experience to some of the recent Marvel movies, which I'm convinced killed off half my remaining brain cells. Nolan is known for having big plot twists at the end of a lot of his movies, and while this one didn't get as twisty as most, there still were certain twists and turns that I did not expect or see coming, which is surprising considering it's based on real events. I was also incredibly impressed with how expertly this film builds tension and anticipation in the audience. There were a few moments where I found myself on the edge of my seat, and there was one big moment where my heart was literally pounding with nervous anticipation. The ability to do something like that, even when the majority of the audience know at least vaguely what's going to happen, that's genuinely masterful. So that's the good parts of the movie out of the way. Now onto the bad. 
This movie starts out pretty good, but then as soon as they enter the real world, everything takes a sharp left turn off the rails into the most insane feminine- Wait, wait, that's the wrong movie. Yeah, my bad. I lost track for a minute there and started reviewing the other movie that I have definitely not seen and will not see because I'm straight. Putting aside the movie all in pink, let's get back to the one in black and white. I don't really have any great negatives to speak of. The movie was maybe a little long and maybe a little slow, but I didn't find myself getting bored. I was just a little hesitant to devote so much of my Saturday to a movie of any kind, which is why I found myself checking my watch from time to time. Other than that, I actually don't have any criticisms, which might make this a rather short review, we'll see. I did not notice a single instance of woke messaging in Oppenheimer. No outright leftist agenda, no in-your-face identity politics, no race-swapping historical figures, none of it. Not only that, I didn't even detect any of the more subtle things either. No digs at characters based on gender or race. No undermining the male lead characters to make the female characters look better. Nothing. I shouldn't really be surprised, but I am. These days, it's just so uncommon to watch an apolitical film that I almost don't know how to react to it. But there is one point that I've heard some of my fellow right-leaning reviewers say, which is that this movie is utterly obsessed with communism, and it paints that era as if everything was just a constant unjustified witch hunt for communists, all an overreaction to the harmless, decent communists who suffered such persecution. But I disagree. And I'll explain why, but first I think I need to bring my non-spoiler section to a close. So before I move into spoilers, I'll conclude by saying this movie is extremely well made, but it's not a movie for casual, light-hearted viewing. It's serious, it's long, it's a little slow, and it doesn't leave you hopeful or optimistic about the world. But it's certainly a journey that I would say is worth experiencing at least once. If I let my personal enjoyment sway the scale, I'd maybe give it a 7 or 8 out of 10, but if I try to be more objective and look at only the quality of the film, I might rate it a little higher than that, because it genuinely is a really good movie. But now moving into spoilers and back into the communism topic. This movie does talk about communism a lot. But as I mentioned earlier, I never felt like it was pushing the idea at all. To me, it seemed like it was just trying to accurately depict that aspect of Oppenheimer's past and the way it later came back to bite him. As I mentioned, some other reviewers apparently felt like it was depicting that era as a communist witch hunt, but I don't feel like that was really the point. I think you could definitely say that it felt like it was depicting Oppenheimer's security clearance revokement as a witch hunt. Is revokement a word? What would it be? Annulment? I don't know, but you get what I'm referring to. The hearing in which Oppenheimer tries to fight the decision to revoke his security clearance did feel like a witch hunt. And that was the part where they kept bringing up his past ties to members of the Communist Party. But I never felt like it was trying to say, look how unjustly persecuted he was simply for being linked to communists in the past. The impression that I got was that the whole hearing was unjust because Strauss set it up that way. They weren't coming for him for being connected to communists. They were coming after him because Strauss had a grudge against him, which was completely unrelated to any ideology. And they were simply using the communist ties as an excuse to justify their actions. Maybe it did downplay the evils of communism a little bit, I guess, but it certainly didn't praise them, which is more than you can say for movies like Ant-Man 3. Even Oppenheimer himself did not seem particularly favorable to the party, given that he refused to join, argued with Florence What's-Her-Name about the doctrine, and actively tried to talk his brother out of joining. Now, was he as against it as I would be? No, but that doesn't matter. This movie sets out to depict his story with at least a moderate degree of accuracy, and so it should naturally reflect his actual political views. But even if it did depict things as an unjust communist witch hunt, that might still be acceptable given the fact that we are somewhat viewing a lot of this movie's events through the lens of Oppenheimer's perception. And if he saw it that way, then that would be fair to depict it in that way in the movie. But that's not even the case. So anyway, that's enough about communism, or else my video might end up coming across just as obsessed as the movie did to some. The other main thing I wanted to mention in this spoiler section is how well Robert Downey Jr. played the villain. And maybe villain is too strong a word, but this movie clearly positions the audience to view Oppenheimer as the protagonist and Strauss as the antagonist, after it's revealed that he was the one who set Oppie up anyway. And Downey just plays that role to perfection. Also, I didn't mention this before, but I really liked fake Han Solo in this movie too. He was great. The Trinity Test, the only scene in the movie where we actually get to see an atom bomb going off, is just incredible. That was the part where my heart was actually pounding in anticipation. It actually made me almost anxious watching, waiting as they prepped everything and began the countdown. For a brief moment, I thought Nolan might have overdone it with the complete silence during the visual side of the explosion. You know, I knew the sound blast wouldn't be instant, but I almost felt like he made us wait too long. But then he made up for it with this awesome moment where Killian Murphy sees the explosion and in the silence he whispers that quote, 
Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Then the sound blast hits you like a freight train and it's so much more impactful. I love the usage of that line there. It was In that moment, it was just perfect. I also did think it was a really bold choice having the bomb go off at the two thirds point of the film, especially in a film this long. Like just before the bomb went off, I was checking my watch and I was thinking, I can't possibly imagine how we're going to hold the audience's attention for almost another hour after this. You know, this is the bit we're all excited to see. How are you going to keep us interested afterwards? And yet somehow it did. The next hour went so fast and I didn't even feel like the best part was already over or anything like that. Also, it just now occurred to me how insane it is that the movie got us all so unbelievably hyped just to see one explosion. Like, how many action films have countless explosions, often starting from the first few minutes of the film? How many even have nuclear explosions depicted on screen? And yet none of those have anywhere close to the impact that this one explosion had. The fact that Nolan managed to build it up so much that we were all on the edge of our seats waiting to see one single explosion, that's just so impressive to me. The other thing I almost forgot to mention is the nudity in this film, which I know a lot of people were saying was completely unnecessary. Now, normally I would agree, I almost always find nudity and sex scenes in movies to be utterly needless and mildly irritating, but this time I actually think it did serve a purpose. At least one of the scenes did. So there's, there's three scenes with explicit nudity, and I can definitely see how people would find the first two completely pointless. They're just, you know, hookup scenes, whatever. The third one, though, is a completely different story. I'm talking about the scene where Oppenheimer is being questioned about his relationship with the communist chick during his security clearance hearing. And he's sitting at the end of the table answering their questions as they interrogate him on the night he spent with her a few years ago. He answers honestly, confirming that he cheated on his wife with her. And as the camera pans around behind one of the other men in the room, when it emerges on the other side, suddenly we see Oppie and he's sitting there at the table completely naked. Now, obviously he's not actually canonically naked in that moment in that hearing. And the camera only shows him from the waist up, so we're not in the explicit territory yet. But it's clear that the point of this scene is to demonstrate how exposed and violated he feels by this whole ordeal. That's not just a shirtless scene for the sake of it. It serves a very specific purpose in the scene, and it's you know it has the, exactly the impact that Nolan intended. The audience feels uncomfortable, just like Oppenheimer does in that moment. But then it takes it a step further as the officials continue interrogating him, and the camera moves again to show the wife's perspective as he continues to speak on the record about the affair. The next trick cut reveals not only a naked Oppenheimer sitting at the table, but also a naked Florence Whatever's character straddling him as if they are committing the adultery right there for all to see. If the previous bit was uncomfortable for the audience, this part is downright disturbing, to the point where it's almost hard to watch, and that's exactly the point. It's designed to show just how horribly humiliated the wife feels in this moment. She feels as if her husband may as well have just had his one night stand with the communist right there in the hearing room, because now it's on the record officially for everyone to see and know about. The whole world knows how he has been unfaithful to her, how he's made a fool of her, and she feels so disgusted and disgraced by it. I think that's about as good a use of explicit nudity in a film as I can recall, and I do genuinely think the scene would have been far less impactful without it. It's also one of the few instances where simply using implied nudity would not have hit nearly as hard because you wouldn't get the same shock and discomfort in the audience. But even with that scene being so well done, one might still ask the question, was it worth it? The film got an R rating in America, though weirdly not here in Australia, because of the nudity and only the nudity. There was nothing else to justify such a high rating, which means simply cutting or reshooting those three scenes could have brought this movie down to a lower rating for a more broad audience, which would have led to much wider appeal. In most cases, R-rated movies simply do not make as much money in the box office, and I just don't know if that one scene was enough to justify the hurt that this rating would have done to the film's general audience appeal. But no one would have known this, and clearly he still felt it was so important that he was willing to accept a slightly lower box office number just in the name of not sacrificing his creative integrity. And that's one of the things that I love about Nolan. He doesn't seem to care about the things that Hollywood executives and directors generally live in fear of. It's not just this, either. The Oscars these days require a certain quota of diversity, equity, and inclusivity representation in every movie in order for it to qualify for their outdated, pathetic little awards. Most filmmakers seem to have bent to the will of these idiotic requirements because they haven't yet realized how little Oscars and Emmys actually mean in this day and age. Yet take a look at the cast of this movie. Do you see much diversity? This is exactly the kind of movie that people would generally describe as Oscar bait, and yet with the current guidelines, it probably wouldn't even qualify. Is it because Nolan's a racist? No. 
He just has enough artistic integrity to say, no, I'm going to make my movies how I want to make them. And if it doesn't make sense to bend to these stifling Oscar requirements, then I will not bend. Clearly in a historical movie like this, set in this era in this country based on real people from history, it would make no sense to cast a bunch of black gay obese humans of indeterminate gender so he doesn't do it, no matter how much the Oscars would love it. And I feel that's the same attitude that has led him to stick to his guns on the nudity thing too and insist on including it in spite of the consequences. He felt it needed to be included to accurately represent that part of Oppenheimer's life so he included it. No compromise. And briefly on that Oscar point, it's possible that he may have had a very diverse crew behind the scenes and maybe he still gets this film over the line for, you know, to qualify for the award, but I wouldn't count on it. So other things I love briefly, it was really cool with that reveal at the end where Strauss wanted to know who had swung the vote against him and not Han Solo basically says something like, oh, just some nobody trying to make a name for himself. Kennedy? John F. Kennedy? <laughs> like I liked that line, that was great. And I really liked that scene where Oppenheimer comes to Einstein and says something like, years ago I came to you worried our work could start a chain reaction that would destroy the world. Now I fear our work has started a chain reaction which will destroy the world. It was worded better than that, but that's the general idea of it, because they thought there was a chance that the atomic reaction would continue on and on endlessly, blowing up the whole world, but now he's worried that the nuclear arms race will you know, continue on endlessly and it will eventually end in Armageddon. That was just a really cool way to end the movie, especially with the accompanying visuals, but as I said, it really doesn't end on a positive note. There's a lot more things I could say about this movie, things I loved, things I didn't fully understand, things I found incredibly interesting and educational but it's pretty much all well out of my area of expertise, so I'll leave it there. I'm a writer, not a scientist or a historian or a political commentator, and yet somehow I'm almost at a loss as to what to even say about the quality of the writing of this movie. Sometimes when something is just so good, it's actually hard to point to exactly why it's good, which is why I've spent a lot of time in this review just comparing it to other movies with far worse writing. All I can really say is, if you haven't seen it and you are even passingly interested in the subject, or in any of Nolan's other films, go and see this one. You will not regret it. So those are my thoughts on Oppenheimer. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Like the video if you want to, subscribe at your own risk, and until next time, keep your pen on the paper and your sword in the scabbard.